If you have your Bibles tonight, turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 15. Well, we're just going right along. Chapter 15 now. And tonight, we're going to talk about these seven vials. And I'm not just going to use one verse for a text. I'm going to skip around a little bit and use these as a text. So tonight, if you'll just stand, and we're going to look at our first verse tonight in Revelation 15, 1, and then we'll go to verse 6, 7, and then we'll go to chapter 16, verse 1, but the, I'm doing that for a reason. So let's read these verses together. Verse uh, 15, Chapter 15, verse 1 says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven la last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And then verse 6. And the seven angels came out of the temple having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts skirted uh, with golden girdles. And then verse 7. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials, full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And then uh, Revelation 16, verse 1. And the Bible says there, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of wrath of God upon the earth. So tonight, we're going to get into these uh, vials, these bowls, and we're going to talk about them for a little bit tonight. And we're going to go slow because I don't want you to miss anything. Because I believe that these are some of the most important chapters in the book of Revelation, talking about what's going to happen with this end time uh, things that are going to go on. And I think it's good that we try to understand them. Let's thank the Lord for the reading of his word. Father, we love you and we thank you. We lift you up and we magnify you because you're worthy of our praise. Now tonight, Father, we get into these vials, these bold judgments, these horrible, horrific things that are going to happen during the tribulation period, the last three and a half years. Father, tonight, help us to open our minds and our hearts so we can understand uh, how horrible that these things are going to be upon this earth. We want to thank you, Father, tonight. Those of us that are saved, of course, will be gone. We'll be in heaven with you. Those that reject you will have to go through these things. Father, we just pray tonight that we can become the witness that we need to be. That people can see the love of Jesus in us when we tell them about these things that are going to happen so that, Lord, we can win our friends and our sisters and brothers and our cousins and uncles and friends that are around us so we can win them to Jesus. Show us tonight, Father. Teach us. Rivet into our hearts the things that we need to have to share the light of Jesus Christ. Thank you for what you're going to do. Thank you for loving us the way that you do. Most of all, thank you for saving us. We pray all this in the most precious name I know, and that's the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, tell somebody you love them tonight. Amen. Thank you. I want to welcome all of those that are watching us by live stream and uh, thankful that you are with us tonight and thankful that all of you here in the sanctuary are with us tonight and I want to invite all of those that are watching us by live stream to church on Sunday morning you come be with us I think the Lord will bless you and uh, you just if you live in town now I know some of you are watching in California and different places and you may not be able to come on Sunday morning but those that are watching us in town we would like for you to come and be part of the service. Well, the age in which we live in now, the scripture 
gives a name, and it is the age of the dispensation of grace, the dispensation of the grace of God. That's where you and I live right now. In Ephesians chapter 3, three verse 2, it says about this, If you have heard of the dispensation of grace of God, which is given me to you, word. In other words, we live under the grace of God. When did that begin? Well, it began at Pentecost with the birth of the church, the body of Christ. And it will end at the rapture of the church. So I want you to understand that and know that because the rapture is when Christ will take us out of this world. The true church he will take out one day and we will be gone. Then there will be a brief period of time which is called the seven years of tribulation that will happen right after that. And during this time, the world will experience the severest travail and sorrow and war and destruction and death as this world has ever seen. It will never be like this. It will be so horrible during this time of tribulation period. And at the end of this awful period, Christ will return and kill all of his enemies. He's going to destroy his enemies one day, the wicked, and he's going to set up his kingdom on this earth one day. How many understand that? And then after that is going to follow a thousand years of prosperity and peace among the nations. And nature will experience this and the earth will experience this also. And then at the end of this thousand year millennial reign, Satan will be loosed for a little season. The wicked will be judged and cast with Satan into the lake of fire. And we have studied the history of the professing church. In Revelation chapter 1 verse 3, we studied that a long time ago, but I hope you remember that. We called it the church age. In chapter 4, we talked about the rapture of the church. The church is called out there, and the church is not here on this earth anymore. We're in heaven with Christ. And after the church is gone, the Antichrist will come, and he will set up his kingdom and his false religious system and then with the false prophet, they will rule. Now, in chapters 15 through 19, here in Revelation, it describes the last and the final phase of this false church here on this earth. The false church in the last three and a half years will be characterized by these um, seven last plagues that we're going to talk about over the next few weeks. These last plagues will definitely be the wrath of God on earth. They will be worse than anything that we've seen before. They will be more catastrophic than anything we have ever seen before. It will be one of the most horrible time that this earth has ever seen when these seven last plagues, the wrath of God, will be poured out. The words vile or bowls will be used to describe them. So anytime you hear me say that, you will understand this is a plague. This is the time that these last plagues, and they're called vials or bowls. And so I'm going to attempt to give you a main outline of this. It'll be simple, and we'll look at it, and we'll go on to the next thing. But I'm going to attempt to do this in a... Uh, a, a way that we all understand, especially myself, and we can see these terrible events as God predicted them. The first thing I want to talk about tonight is a great and marvelous sign. A great and marvelous sign. Revelation 15, if you noticed when we read it a minute ago, speaks of a great and marvelous sign. Now there's a key. There's a key to this great and marvelous mystery. It's given to us in the last part of verse 1, and here's what it says. It says, For in them is filled up the wrath of God. 
In these vials, in these bowls, God says here, here's the mystery revealed, for in these vials and bowls are, they're filled up with the wrath of God. In other words, they couldn't get any worse. They're the worst of the worst when it comes to these judgments that will be placed upon this earth. By the way, this is the final stage of this judgment. If you remember, uh, it began with the appearance of the four horsemen. You remember talking about them in our study? It began with them, the four horsemen. That's found in chapter 6 of the book of Revelation. During the first three and a half years after the true church, after the church is gone, raptured out, been called away, the earth is going to be plagued by war, pestilence, destruction, and death. That's what the world will face. Not much to look forward to, is it? How in the world would people not want to trust Christ as their Savior? How in this world do people not love Jesus? He came to set them free. But there will be millions upon millions that will not accept Him and go through this horrible time. This terrible stuff will go on until almost half of the entire population of the world has perished, is gone. How grateful we should be that God has provided a way of escape tonight. And we're going to talk about that on Sunday. You need to be here. How Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. Doesn't matter who you are. He will save you if you will ask Him to save you. He was the sacrifice. He died and rose again. And now He's in heaven waiting to come and get us. We just need to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is a way of escape. And I'm so glad tonight that I trust Jesus as my Savior. How about you? And those of us who have been saved do not have to fear this awful thing that's going to come up on this earth. You don't have to go home tonight and worry about the tribulation period. You don't have to go home and worry about all these uh, judgments that I'm going to speak of in the next few weeks and all the wrath of God upon this earth. You don't have to worry about that because God has saved you out of that. And I'm so thankful tonight. But why are we preaching this? Why are we talking about this then, preacher? Why are you even uh, mentioning this? Because we are, uh, we are the salt of the earth and the light of the earth, and we need to tell people what's going to go on. We have to know. We live in a day and time that we can see the shadows of the things that the Bible spoke of all these years happening right now in our day and time. Things are happening faster than ever before. Technology is bringing more destructive weapons upon the scene than ever before. Destruction is something that can happen in a second, in just a moment of time, at any place, any time, because of the things that we have now. We have smart bombs. We have bombs that can be uh, launched from a ship or from a, a platform and it can target uh, something miles and miles, hundreds and thousands, miles away and go exactly where it needs to go. It can go through a window of a home if they need it to. We have technology that can do things that they only dreamed about 40 and 50 years ago. We have nuclear warheads which can destroy not just places but entire nations in just a moment of time. When you think about these things and think about what we can do in our generation right now in this time, I'm telling you folks, if you wasn't saved, it would scare you to death. But thank God we're saved tonight and we know the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know uh, when I was a young man, you think you just have all this time. Folks, I'm here to tell you the way we're going, the way it is escalating. I'm talking about prophecy and when Jesus is going to come, the way it is escalating. It could happen tonight. 
Seems like that people are always looking for something in prophecy to let them know that it could happen sooner. I'm here to tell you, nothing else needs to happen but Jesus come and take us out of this place. Nuclear warheads. Not only that, we have countries that shouldn't have nuclear warheads that now have them. Countries that are not really, uh, you know, they really don't think right when it comes to humanity. They don't care anything about you, don't care anything about lives, don't care anything about any of that. They just have nuclear warheads, and I'm telling you, one thing could set them off and this thing could happen. Tonight we live in a place that really is just like a powder keg. It could blow up at any time. We have intelligence tonight that knows where you are. You say, preacher, they can't know that. I'm here to tell you there's just a, a story out this week that, that, that tells you that. They know just about everything about you. Let me tell you something else. You've got a car and it's got a little button on top of it that says OnStar. And you've got OnStar. They know where you are at, at, at all times. Matter of fact, you go out somewhere and, and you have a little fender bender and you, you see if they don't come on OnStar and say, Mr. Hurt, are you all right? Because they know where you're at. It's a scary time, isn't it? Smartphones that, that they seem to think now with all the smart technology that we have. I mean, folks, they can find you. They can find you. Uh, they can take your smartphone and see where you were at a certain time because of where it's pinging off of a tower somewhere. They know exactly where you're at. This was just things that we dreamed about 20, 40 years ago that we didn't even know that could ever happen. I remember just a few years ago when I first, uh, you know, Terry and I were first married, it, it was probably in my 30s, I probably 31 or 32, I worked for this phone company, AT&T, and they came out with this phone that you could see. I don't know how it worked, but you could see who you were talking to. And I thought to myself, and it cost thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And I thought to myself, nobody could ever afford this. And now you can take your cell phone and you can have FaceTime and talk to somebody in California and see them. It just keeps expanding faster and faster, and faster. And that's where we're at. We know that this old world has enough modern weapons to destroy everything at a moment's time. Destruction is on the brink of happening tonight. And all it would take is for God to come and get us. God is going to use all of these things to one day judge this old world. All the technology He's going to use for His own. You want to know why? Because God's the one that gave us this technology. He gave us the brains and uh, uh, these smart people to do all these things. And God will use them against them one day. So a great and marvelous sign. Secondly, the end is near. When the pouring out of this seven vials will come, uh, the end uh, will happen and there will be a period of God's judgment. However, before John describes this awful judgment that's going to happen, which will come in these vials one after another as it is poured out, he stops to give us a picture of those who will be spared all this misery. Listen to what he says in Revelation chapter 15, verses 2 through 4. Here's what he says about this. And I saw as there were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had uh, gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, uh, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. The sea of glass. 
The sea of glass there reminds us of another sea of glass mentioned in Revelation chapter 4. We talked about it. But the sea here that is mentioned is very different. The Bible says that this sea is mingled with fire. What does that mean? The reason is very evident. It's evident because chapter 4 speaks of the raptured saints uh, before the tribulation. Chapter 15 describes the saints who have gone through the tribulation. So these are saints here that we're talking about tonight that went through the tribulation and got saved. They went through the fire. They went through all of this horrible stuff that's going on here on this earth. And they got saved. And that's what the Bible's speaking of here is these folks, the sea mingled with fire. In Scripture, fire always is a symbol of of judgment and the saints in Revelation 15 they stand on that sea of fire and those that come through the great tribulation were saved you say how do you know that well it's evident listen to Revelation 15 too it says has gotten the victory over what and over his what and over his mark and over the number of his name. In other words, they came through all that. They did not take the mark of the beast. They did not worship him. They, they did not bow down to his image. This is those that came through the tribulation and were saved. That's what it's talking about. The sea mingled with fire. Revelation 15.3 says, And they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, the song of the Lamb. If you want to tonight, you can go home and read that. Because the song of Moses was the song which Israel sang after the host of Pharaoh uh, perished in the Red Sea. It's found in Genesis chapter 15 verses 1 through 12. It's a song of praise to God. And God delivered them from their cruel Gentile oppressors and the wrath of the Antichrist here in uh, Revelation chapter 15. They will sing again the song of deliverance. And at that time, they will be in heaven with Jesus Christ. So we have seen a great and marvelous sign. We have seen the end is near. But thirdly, I want you to look the, of the plan of God. Revelation 15 verses 5 through 8. Here's the plan of God for this time. And after that I looked and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded uh, with the golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. You know what, folks? It's always been God's purpose to judge sinners that did not accept Him. And not only that, not only to judge sinners, but destroy sin. Did you know that? The eternal fire has been prepared for the devil and his angels, but it also awaits those whom reject God. There are people really in hell tonight. I know that sometimes we forget to even think about that. We think that this is all going to happen in the end time. Right now, tonight, people are in hell. And they are there feeling the flames and feeling the punishment of all of their wickedness in hell tonight. Judgment has fallen upon them when they left this earth without Jesus Christ. And one of these days, the walls of hell will widen when people will reject him by the millions and millions. And one of these days, this eternal fire that is prepared for the devil and his angels will be an eternity for those that go there. God's holy angels, right now in heaven, await the time when they will play their role in God's judgment of these sinners. These people that never accepted Christ. But now John's attention is now upon these angels. He looks at these angels who will carry out this, this judgment upon the earth. 
And he's looking at the temple, is what the Bible says. And as he watches the temple to see the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened up. The apostle had seen similar sights in the earlier visions in Revelation chapter 11, verse 19, when it said this. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there was lightnings, voices, and thunderings, and earthquakes, and great hell. When you see this, the temple refers to the holy of holies, the inner sanctuary. It's the place where God's presence dwells. And when you see an earlier vision of God's throne room, it was open so that the faithful could see in. In Revelation chapter 4 verse 1, and it says this, After this I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven. Think about that just for a moment. But in this vision, the Bible says that the tabernacle was open to reveal the most severe judgment that will ever happen on the unfaithful of this earth. It's really kind of a scene that is out of a horror picture because you see these angels come out of this in the presence of God and they have these vials of wrath that God is going to pour upon this earth and it's going to do humanity in on this earth. It's the end. It's the last part that will happen to this earth. And this vision, as the tabernacle is open, judgment will be on the unfaithful. John watched and verse 6 says this, The seven angels come out of the temple having the seven plagues. And when John saw that, he knew that time was now up. That the judgment was going to go in succession and it was going to be poured upon this earth. No matter what anybody said, no matter how much begging went on, no matter how many people would say, don't do this, it was going to happen. It happened in succession. And it would come one right after another. But after one would happen, and all the horror of that one, another one would start. And these people had no time to even catch their breath. It was a horrible time on this world, all these judgments to be poured out. And by the way, folks, let me tell you something. The angels will execute whatever God tells them to do. They will do it. They will not hold back. No one can talk them out of it. They will do it. Did you notice how they were dressed? They were dressed and clothed in linen, clean and bright. What does that represent? This fabric represents their holiness and their purity. That judgment is coming in holiness. And by the way, folks, God's judgment is holy and right. We can't sit back and say that God is wrong in His judgment. I'm here to tell you, He's never wrong. His judgment will be holy and right. He's warned time after time again. He's told people time after time again. Messages have been preached time and time again, and still they didn't get saved. They didn't know Jesus. So His judgment will be holy and right, and that's what their clothes represent. And after proceeding from this inner sanctuary of God's heavenly temple, the seven angels receive the means by which they will execute God's judgment. God's power is put on them. Fourthly tonight, let's look at this first bold judgment. It's found in Revelation chapter 16 verse 1. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of wrath of God upon the earth. John resumes his account of what will occur here. He talks about these bowls of wrath as they are poured out. As God brings His judgment upon the earth until He has made it safe for His people. For those who belong to Him. In other words, He will separate I mean, I don't know how he's going to do it, but those that are saved on this earth, somehow he's going to put them aside. He's going to put them to where they will not be bothered with these bold judgments. And those that are lost will get everything they deserve. 
You say, how does he do that? I don't know how he does that. He's God. He, he just does it. He keeps those safe that are his. This is true of the church also. He will not allow us or permit us to go through the tribulation because we'll be called away. But he will pour out his vows on his, of his final wrath until his ancient people Israel have been made safe. He won't do it until they're safe. But once his own have been removed off the scene, the judgments will fall swiftly and terribly upon this earth. So consider them. Look at verse 2. Here's the first one. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark, which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. So the first thing is a grievous sore. You can almost see the angel as a sloshing out of the first bowl goes up on this earth. And what that means is malignant sores. I can't explain this. I, I have seen people that have, you know, these boils that come out on their bodies and how awful it looks and how painful it is. But this sore describes as an inflamed, oozing, ulcerous sore such as we look back in Exodus chapter 9 we see the Egyptians had some of these same things. In Exodus chapter 9, verses 9 through 11, it says this. It says, and it, and it shall become small dust in the land of Egypt, and shall be a bull breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beasts throughout all the land of Egypt. And they took ashes of the furnace and stood before Pharaoh, and Moses sprinkled it upon, uh, up towards heaven, and it became a bull breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beasts. And the magicians and could not stand for, before Moses because of the bulls. For the bull was upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. What kind of bull? An ulcer. I'm talking about a bull that's not just one or two, but a bull that goes from their head all the way down to the bottom of their feet. Their hands are nothing but ulcerous bulls. You say, that's never been seen. That can never happen. I'm here to tell you tonight, it's going to happen. Everyone that's left upon this earth, the first bold judgment will pour out these bulls upon lost humanity and they will suffer like they've never suffered before. It will bring such unbelievable physical torment to them. All of those that... And, and by the way, folks, I want to say something in this. I mean, they suffer all this and then they've got hell. I mean, all this they suffer and then they have to go to hell. These sores will not, as I said, affect believers. Those whose names have been written in the Lamb's book of life. They will come only upon those who choose to follow the Antichrist and choose to receive the mark upon their forehead. The Antichrist followers are suffering the consequences of rejecting Christ and rejecting all the preaching. I mean, think about it. All the preaching that Jesus sent to them. All of the 144,000. You remember we talked about it. All the angels flying through the heavens preaching the gospel. The two witnesses preaching the gospel. They reject every moment of it. Every single message they reject. Can you imagine tonight those folks that are in hell tonight, they remember the rest of eternity, the last message they heard. They remember all those times they sat in a church house like this under conviction and did not give their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. For eternity they will remember that if I had just given my heart to Jesus, I wouldn't be here. That's a horrible thing. But it's the truth. These people, when they die and go to hell, they'll remember every time that the Lord tried to preach to them. Every time they made fun of God and believed the Antichrist, they'll suffer the consequences. 
I want you to notice something, the preaching of the gospel. Look at the warning of the angel given in Revelation chapter 14, verse 7. I'm talking about this preaching. He says, they're saying with a loud voice, fear God. Here's the message. Fear God, give Him glory, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him that made the heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. That was the message that the angels were preaching to all of those on earth. These sores will be similar to those that Zechariah wrote about in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 12. Now this is awful, but I want you to listen. Zechariah 14, 12 says, And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongues shall consume away in their mouth. It's a horrible thing. The second bowl. I've got five minutes. Revelation 16, 3. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of dead men. And every living soul died in the sea before the sores of the first bold judgment could even heal. The second one was poured out, as I told you, in succession. No time to rest. Now think about this one. This bowl was blood that was poured in the sea. It's also similar to the first plague in Egypt. Listen to Exodus seven twenty through 24 And Moses and Aaron did so, as the Lord commanded, and he lifted up the rod and smote the waters that were in the river in the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants. And all the waters that were in the river turned to what? Blood. And the fish that was in the river died and the river stank and and the Egyptians could not drink of the water of the river and there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt and the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments and Pharaoh's heart was hardened neither did he hearken unto them as the Lord had said and Pharaoh turned and went into his house neither did he set his heart to this also, and all the Egyptians digged round about the river for water to drink, for they could not drink of the water of the river. This is the effects of this bowl being poured upon the oceans. It's much more intense and widespread than anyone could ever know. I looked this up, and 70% of this world is covered in the water 70 percent the Bible says that one day when this bowl judgment is poured out this blood that is poured out in the oceans will all turn to blood now, I want you to think about that just for a moment tonight I mean if all the ocean is turned to blood and some of you may not believe this it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not it's the truth but if all the water of the oceans is turned to blood can you imagine the billions and millions and of sea life that will die that quick? Can you imagine not only the smell of the blood, but the smell of all the animals in all the oceans all over the world that die in just a moment of time? I don't know if you've ever seen a pool of blood, but a pool of blood, like if it's on the floor... It coagulates. It, it, it kind of like jelly after it sets there for a while. And that's what the ocean will be. It will be so thick, the waves will not be able to even come in and out. The tides will be changed. And things will die. Ships will not be able to sail across the oceans to take food to other places. This will be a devastating, bold judgment that will affect every single person. And that's what's going to happen. We'll talk a little bit more about this second bold judgment. I just wanted to give you a little information about it. 
Because, folks, you think those first things we went through, I'm talking about the whole oceans, not just part, all of them. I'm talking about bowls upon every human being that does not know Jesus Christ. I'm talking about pain and suffering all over the world on every person that is lost. How horrible is that? And one of these days it's going to happen. As sure as you're sitting here tonight breathing, I'm telling you, one of these days God said it's going to happen and it will happen. Gives you something to think about, doesn't it? Lord Jesus, we love you tonight and we thank you. We thank you for the message and we thank you, Father, for giving us the truth. Letting us know exactly what's going to happen one day in this world. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you for saving us. Help us to be a witness. Help us to be a light to the lost and dying world. Salt. Thank you, Jesus. You may be here tonight. and God has spoke to you. Maybe you know somebody that you really need to tell about Jesus, but it's just been so hard. Maybe you just need to come tonight and just ask Jesus to help you do that. Or maybe you're here tonight and you don't know whether you're saved. I'm going to ask you to come right now. And we will pray with you and show you how to be saved so that you don't have to worry about this stuff. If you're here tonight and you need to come, come. We're just going to wait a few seconds. Lord, we thank you so much. Thank you for allowing us to meet again together and to discuss.